So now we're going to talk more about means. Uh, so if you haven't picked this up, we really like the mean value when we do all these types of studies. Uh, so you've noticed that there are three titles to this presentation. That's because they're all the same. Um, they represent the same distribution. And we're going to start with the term expected probability and we'll transition through each of these throughout the presentation. Uh, it's my hope that with each time we cover the term, you'll get a greater understanding of the importance of this distribution. So we're going to define the expected probability or mean hazard or posterior predictive curve. Uh, we'll talk about how it's calculated. Uh, we'll demonstrate <clears throat> how it's calculated for a Bayesian analysis, which is what we use for dam and levy safety. Uh, and we'll also explain why we use the mean to inform risk. So we're gonna start the presentation with a refresher on expected value. So expected value is the anticipated return from a set of numbers and their corresponding probabilities. So mathematically, it's written as the sum of a random variable multiplied by probability of that random variable. So it's like, Think about a weighted average. So on the side, we have two examples. The first is a normal dice uh, where you have everything's equally weighted. So the probability of getting one, two, three, four, five, or six are all the same. Uh, and each side has the same probability of being rolled. So the expected value of a fair die is the sum of one to six divided by six sides, which actually calculates out to 3.5. So the expected value with a normal six-sided die is 3.5. Now let's consider a die that's actually been weighted such that the low numbers are twice as likely as the high numbers to be rolled, to come up when you roll. So the expected value in this case is three. Uh, it's less because the lower numbers have a higher probability or a higher weight, if you wanna think about it like that. So here's an example for you to practice calculating the expected value. So actually I want you to calculate the expected value and tell me what it is here. Anybody got it? Yep. No, that's great. Um, and, and that's just because all it is is we're looking at the individual value. In this case, our values are 77, 80, 91, and 99. And we're multiplying them by their individual probabilities. Um, it's essentially a weighted average calculation, and that's how we arrive at 90.6. So now let's try a second example with the following data set. Um, any, anybody have the actual number? Yeah, so it's actually 2.78 e to the minus three. Um, now, the two really important things to pay attention to this is like one, this is just an average, a straight average of the x values. And the reason that it is is because the probability of each of these values occurring is equal. So since the probability is equal, you can actually just take a normal average of the x column. And what you're all saying is that even though we're spanning several orders of magnitude, since the probability of each of these events is equally likely, I mean, really, we're weighting it towards whichever value is largest. So in this case, the 0.01 has the most amount of like influence on our answer. Great, now you guys all know how to calculate expected values. So uh, here we can see values plotted with the expected value shown in red. So blue are like our data points from you know, what data we're working with or what sample set we have. And red is the expected value calculation that you just did on the previous slide. And so if we start to add distributions for these, you can kind of see something familiar, which is like the general shape of our full frequency curves that we worked with in best fit. So now that we have a common base knowledge on expected value, let's transition back to the main topic, which is starting with the expected probability termination that most of you are probably familiar with from bulletin 17C, um, or 17B actually. I don't, 17C doesn't discuss expected probabilities a lot but 17b had a, an appendix dedicated to it. So expected probability is the value that we would anticipate calculating and takes into account that our sample is small relative to the annual exceedance probabilities in consideration. Again, we usually have maybe 100 years worth of information or of peak flow data or peak volume frequency or peak volume duration data. And we're trying to estimate out to e to the minus four, e to the minus five, e to the minus six. So there's a lot of uncertainty with what we're trying to do when we get that high out. <clears throat> So the expected probability is a value that we anticipate calculating and takes into account our sample size relative to these really rare exceedance probabilities <clears throat> uh, across the sample probability distributions for a given discharge value. 
So hence the name, the mean hazard curve. You know, our hazard curve is our stage frequency curve. So here we can see the distribution of annual exceedance probability for a selected discharge. Uh, that's what this is. If you looked at like a, a horizontal slice for a given discharge, and the next slide will show this a little bit better. Uh, this plot shows that the distribution is not normally distributed. You can see it as a fairly long tail, so it's an asymmetric or skewed distribution. Um, the expected value is left to the mode for AEPs less than 0.5. And as the range of uncertainty gets larger with less frequent AEPs, the difference between the expected value and the mode uh, increases pretty drastically. So before we get into more detail, I'm going to pause here and transition to using the terminology in Bayesian. Uh, in the Bayesian presentation, we learned that the, well, you will learn that the expected probability is called the predictive value. Okay. So, additionally, the expected probability curve is called the posterior predictive. Ah. Sorry, that's the right slide. So the expected probability curve is called the posterior predictive curve. And the mode curve is, in Bayesian terms, called the posterior mode curve. Um, as you will learn in a future lecture, uh, the posterior references the addition of new information that we add to the initial or prior distribution. So when we start a frequency analysis, what we end up with to get our posterior distribution is our prior distribution plus our new knowledge, where our prior distribution is comprised of our default parameter distribution, regional skew, and precip frequency. Uh, new information, such as systematic data, historic events, a record extension, paleo flood information, which gives us our final estimate or posterior distribution. So earlier I mentioned that the predicted or expected value is the probability that we can anticipate given that we have a small sample size relative to the probabilities of interest. So because the maximum likelihood estimate and expected moments algorithm ignore <coughs> the small sample properties of quantile estimators, small exceedance probabilities have the potential to be exceeded more often than actually intended. So the expected probability or posterior predictive provides confidence that the actual return will approach the expected value as the number of samples increases. So it's important to remember that decisions are made based on the expected return and not on the median or most likely return. Near the end of the Bayesian analysis, the analysis produces an array of equally probable distributions represented by these different colored lines here on this flow frequency plot. Since all the distributions are equally probable, the expected value calculation simplifies to the arithmetic mean. So it was like that example we computed before, the probability of getting any one of these individual distributions is the same. Uh, so we're basically just taking a simplified mean. And so our equation up top actually simplifies to just uh, the discharge value divided by the number of distributions that we're considering, or sorry, the probability divided by the number of distributions that we're considering. And that's how you estimate the expected probability for a given discharge value with these distributions. So we're taking a horizontal slice. So like in this case, we're looking at a discharge of between 100,000 and a million, and we're calculating the expected probability associated with that discharge. Uh, one thing to note is that this horizontal slice, this distribution represents the slice. You can see that there's a lot of asymmetry. And that's because our sample size is significantly smaller than some of the annual exceedance probabilities we're trying to estimate. And so the expected value actually accommodates for this asymmetry because it accounts for natural variability in our analysis, as well as our knowledge and certainty, which stems from how much data we actually have available and how much we know. And because of this asymmetry, this is why we do this calculation horizontally like that. If we were to take a vertical slice, you would not have the exact same asymmetry that you see here. And so that's why we calculate an expected value for a given discharge rather than uh, an expected discharge for a given probability. So here's an example of calculating the predictive value. So the example in this slide shows 20 sample distributions. And to create the predictive curve, it's calculated at multiple different discharges. Uh, the predictive curve is shown in black as a dashed line. So <clears throat> Our x value in this case 
for the given discharge in the black line, which is between, it looks like 10,000 and 100,000. Uh, we're saying that each of these individual discharges represented by the color lines are equally probable. And there are 20 of them, so that's why we have 0.05, 1, and 20. And we're taking the average of these. And so that's how we get the expected probability estimate for a given discharge. Uh, credible intervals are typically calculated vertically or by taking a vertical slice denoted by that red up and down arrow across a given annual exceedance probability. We usually look at the 5th and 95th percentile values from a rank order listing, which are used to inform our credible intervals because we're trying to capture the 90% uncertainty or credible interval. So though the credible intervals can be calculated either vertically across an annual exceedance probability or horizontally across a discharge, uh, you should usually get the same answer in either direction. And that's because this computation is a little bit different. We're looking at essentially the percentage of distributions in the top 5% or the bottom 5%, and we're looking at the 90% the credible interval. So we're not actually calculating this in the same way that we're using that expected value formula. So let's wrap all this up by enforcing why we use the expected probability to inform risk. Uh, this quote from Leo Beard states, the expected probability can serve as a basis for computing the expected return on an investment. Uh, also in our USACE engineer manuals, it states that expected flow frequency curve is the optimal estimator in the context of flood hydrology and should be used to inform decisions. Uh, now let's look at an example with a levy. If the top of the levy is equal to the computed median or 1% flood level, that levy will actually overtop more frequently on average than once every 100 years. Uh, like we would expect, which is kind of counterintuitive because we normally think if you're designing using a median frequency curve to the 1% event, you're good. But that's not the case, and that's why we use the expected value. So if the top of the levy is equal to the expected or mean 100-year flood level, then the levy will overtop on average every once every, every once in every 100 years, which is good. Um, and that's how we intend to design, and that's actually how flood insurance rate work. <laughs> So in today's workshop, um, you'll get a chance to calculate the posterior predictive and the credible intervals in a spreadsheet and actually see how these computations work. So hopefully it'll tie together nicely with what we're just talking about now. So remember that the posterior predictive is calculated horizontally, and that's because of the asymmetry in the distribution, uh, which also reflects our knowledge uncertainty, or the fact that we have essentially a really small sample compared to what we're trying to estimate, which is really rare. Since all distributions have the same probability, or all distributions are equally likely to occur, then the expected value can be simplified down to just a mean. So you're just basically averaging the annual exceedance probability associated with a specific discharge of interest. And you'll do that for several different discharges, and then you'll interpolate a curve between those points. So credible intervals are calculated vertically, or using a vertical slice across a given annual exceedance probability. Uh, the 5th and 95th rank order discharges are used to inform the 90% credible intervals. We always use expected probability to inform risk, especially when we're developing the hydrologic hazard curve. You want to use the expected probability curve, not the mode curve. Uh, 